come in, but um, just to start off, my name is Josh Nelson. I'm the Pistol representative for here in Northern New England. I'm Tony Roberts. I'm the service manager for Green Hunt for New England. And uh, this being the first time we've done all a class like this, we've got an hour, specifically an hour to do, and then at 4.15 we've got to catch the bus for the off-site. So we're kind of each, we each have about a 45 minute presentation sort of specific to our brands. Um, so just by show of hands to start off, those of you that are customers, are here, um, what do you write? Show of hands for guys that run Vistabos. Okay, anybody run free dots? Yeah, you do too, right? So you guys are going to Tony was kind enough to offer to kind of go out and do a walk around on the machine to do a, a sort of specific to that brand, and I can do the presentation in here for those of you that want to split it up. Yeah, guys that want to talk about bringing up Bombardier stuff, we've got the caps out there. I'd be happy we go out and just get around the caps and talk about that stuff, or, or do you want to keep it in here? Keep it all in here. Stay out of the sun. Like you don't care. <laughs> it's your decision. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, we'll just stay in here then, and, and by all means, as we go through this, if you have specific brand questions, you know, pipe up. Don't hesitate. Um, this is a presentation that's a whole lot more interesting if everybody's involved. So just starting it off. Um, this is the two-track vehicle maintenance program or session. I guess. Uh, overview, overview of what we're planning to talk about here, just sort of high-level stuff, um, not getting into the real nuts and bolts specific stuff. A lot of you, you know, may or may not get that involved with the machines anyway. So we'll just kind of talk it over, give you a decent base of information to work off of. Uh, we put together some stuff here on vehicle service and maintenance, both on from an in-season perspective as well as from a summer perspective, summer service, which uh, both have, both, they're both very important, they're both just uh, a little bit different from one to the other. And I've got some stuff in here, if we have time on it, going over operation techniques and, and uh, you know, ways to be a little bit more efficient, and then some of the efficient stuff that's coming down the pipe that's also. Um, to start off, really, we've got two different programs, two different train of thoughts, basically, on vehicle maintenance. The first one being a reactive, or you fix it when it's broke. Typically, you end up band-aiding things together. You're in an emergency mode where you know it's broken on the trail. It's Friday night, and you got the poker run the next morning. Uh, you end up a lot of times you end up fixing the symptom rather than fixing the actual problem itself, and you end up with a lot of recurring problems that go on this trail. The other one is, is looking at it from a preventative maintenance uh, standpoint, where you do it on a planned interval. You're looking at have an idea of when things are going to start to wear out, and so you get take care of that stuff when it's a little bit easier to do. You have a better tendency to fix it right the first time around rather than just band-aiding it back together. In a lot of cases, you're able to do more with less, and uh, the really nice thing is you can do some of those more difficult tasks um, that are more labor-intensive and kind of a pain. You can do it when it's easiest, whether that's in your summer maintenance, replacing dry hoses and things like that, or um, suspension and things like that rather than doing it out on the trail. One note on this, you'll never entirely get rid of reactive maintenance. Stuff's always going to break in opportune times. It seems like it's just the way it goes. Uh, just a little perspective on the whole thing. There's a lot of resources out there and I think that's kind of one takeaway that we want everybody to get on this is to use your available resources. Both manufacturers as well as everybody else, we offer a ton of information. We're here to serve the customer and take care of the customer, help out, offer whatever information you need. Um, you know, most of the time, we're a phone call away. You know, if there is an issue, by all means, give us a call. Um, the service schools, both manufacturers offer a service school. Um, Ours will be is uh, more of the outline areas towards the end of this one. Yeah. 
We do one that's a little bit later in the summer typically. Depending on your region though, <coughs> I know every one of our offices does one also. Yeah, you guys do too. So across the country. Yeah, if you wherever you're at, get in touch with your local dealership or your local <coughs> shop and uh, find out when that is. It, it's a, you get a ton of information, one from our technical service people, but we hear all the time that customers get even more information from talking back and forth to each other. So yeah, you can you can just gain a ton of info right there. Uh, this is something we hear somewhat frequently that you know guys are just too proud to call it. Oh, I can figure it out. I'll deal with it, and then you know the machine's down for days or even weeks at a time when it, a simple phone call would have basically been able to solve the problem and come through it. So definitely swallow your pride. Call us if you need any help. Another thing, um, we both put together um, incentives and offers as far as spring specials with parts and several service specials. Uh, something to really pay attention to. I, mean, we, I think you guys sent out a flyer also. Yeah. Send out a flyer that basically lays out what we've got to offer. Take advantage of that stuff. You can save yourself. I mean, on our spring special parts, it's 20%. On a lot of the, the normal maintenance items, your filters, your uh, track belts, if you're doing them, you know, those things that you're going to end up having to do anyway. If you can plan it and be on that preventative maintenance program, you can get it and save yourself a lot of money. <coughs> Going on to summer service, which is kind of the state we're at right now after the season. Uh, it's great to have a good plan for your summer service. You see some of the more successful operations keep a really good list of what's going on with the machine as, uh, throughout the course of the season. Especially towards the end of the season, you'll have things, you know, there'll be a small leak that isn't anything to really worry about in the last day or so. Um, or that, you know, you'll start to see a host chafing in some place or different things that are aren't major right away, but if you keep a list of them, you can make sure to address those in the summer rather than hoping you remember it at the end of the summer when you do your maintenance and then heading out on your first trip and, and realizing you forgot to take care of them. So, um, it helps you not forget those, those little things. Same point, it helps you avoid the early downtime, stay on a preventive program. Um, also, some of those non-annual service items for us, you know, the hydraulic oil doesn't necessarily need to be changed every year. The oil itself is good for 1,200 hours. We say 1,000, but again, it's, it's based on hours of use. Yeah. So, and those are things, if you keep track of it over time, you can save yourself some money. There's no point in dumping the oil. Or, yes, sir. Yeah, quick question on that. Uh, yeah. 1,200 hours, obviously, a lot of us, I know, don't put out 1,200 hours in any one year, right? Sure. Right. What would you consider to be a... Uh, Max for like the calendar, well, the time frame. Is it three years as an example? You're thinking so, I, five I, I, years? So, within yeah. five years that you should drop it in? Do you have any? I advise here. How many hours in a season do you have? Uh, two to four varies. This year it was zero because she's never right. got out of the cap. Then I, you know, based on hours, I do three years. Uh, yeah, exactly. about three years. Too. You know, the other thing you got to remember is if you're not cycling that oil. Oh, yeah. During the season, you get the condensation and that. So, I would do three years. You know, based on your average hours per year, if you're doing 500 hours a year, you do it every two years. Yeah, we're working with averages to fit short. So, the coolant's also it's a three-year, 3,600 hours. Here again, it's, you don't have to replace it every year. So, you save yourself some money by planning that out and keeping track of it. Um, going through on your summer service, we see a lot of clubs that just say, oh, hey, we didn't run that many hours, we'll just do the fluids and filters and be good to go. And in a lot of cases, you can get away with that once. Um, once. <laughs> but you don't want to continue to do that every year. The summer is a great time to take the tracks off and get a look at your suspension and your frame rails and check for any cracks in there and check for loose connections and fittings and things like that. Stuff that you're not really going to check over in season when you're going you know, as crazy as you can possibly go to get it all done. Um, summertime's great for that sort of thing. Uh, we do have a manufacturer's checklist that we go through also that's, depending on the machine, it's five or six pages. But you know, it goes through everything and it, some of it's just a little check electrical connections and you can put a check on it and you're all set with that. 
Um, in the summer service, definitely you want to look for some out of the ordinary things, looking at the frame and suspension. The pump and motor mounting bolts is something that um, can really come back to bite you if you don't check those. Um, there's, and I've got in here, I'll show you, uh, we've got a spec sheet that we give with every machine that has every torque spec for all those different bolts. Um, and especially on these hydrostatic machines, if, if those don't get checked and they are loose and wiggle their way out in season, Typically, they're not going to wiggle their way out sitting in the garage and end up carrying a pump with you out onto the trail somewhere to repair it. That's a major job that's definitely not anything you have to do. Definitely, it's preventive. How many guys at the end of the season do you, do you do a walk around on your cat and, and make a list at the end of the season before you park it or any of that? Do you guys do that? Yeah. And how many of you guys detract the machine? Yep. How about detensioning it and putting it up on blocks? How many store it out of sunlight? Uh, yes, we got that. <laughs> <laughs> we got that. Best things you can do for your for your you know your two track vehicle is to you know detrack it, roll your tracks up, store them up out of sunlight, put your vehicle up on sand or unweight the suspension. If you can't do that, <coughs> at least get the vehicle up in the air, <coughs> detention it, and cover the tracks with the I mean, the UV and, and being tensioned all season just deteriorates the belt line. And it gets undue, you know, strain on the suspension parts when it sits all season. Especially after a year that we had this year where, like you said, you can go out. So, it's quite common in the RV store. How many of you go through and grease your machines right away at the end of the season? Yeah, that's important. You gotta, that water gets in there, and if it's if you run fresh grease in, you push it right through, and you don't have to worry about it. If it sits there through the summer, it creates all kinds of corrosion and other problems. Yeah, that's a big one. Goes to what we were talking about. Some of the preventive maintenance items: drive hoses, bearings, seals. Track belts, I mean, that, that, it's unbelievable how expensive track belts are and what little actual maintenance people get to the tracks. It's, it is. It, we drive by, I see it all summer long, we drive by machines that are parked out in the, park, or, you know, in the parking lot or the dooryard or wherever, sitting there just with weeds growing up through the tracks. And I mean, it's literally thousands of dollars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some of these aftermarket health, health guys are really like yeah. saying, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All us manufacturers are happy to take the money for spare parts. Save your club a lot of money by just doing, you know, just basic stuff. You know, covering them up, detention, retorques, things yeah. like that. This goes to what we were just talking about the tracks. Um, how many go through and torque your tire guides for your track belts in the summer? Everybody, that's probably the tire guides for sure. That's a big one that um, <laughs> there's a lot of stress that go through those. Hey, uh, one of the Pistoli manufacturers told us is that if they're not coming loose, then don't tighten them because they came from the factory with uh, the blue Loctite. And if you break that blue Loctite, then you can start having loose. Yeah, and that's true for the new machine. Well, yeah, brand new machine and just on the belts. The tire guides don't have the, the, the blue Loctite on them. No. So you want to go through it too. I mean, you you can hear those if they're loose. You can hear when they're loose, and typically what I tell people with with brand new tracks anyway is to you know, go through and do 20 sort of randomly, and if none of them turn, you're probably going to be worth it. Yeah, well, I think, you know, we're the same way on our side. It's a percentage of bolts. So if you go to 20 bolts, 30 bolts of a belt, and they're all within spec, then you typically don't need to reach it. Um, inspecting your belts and grounders is a big one. This kind of goes back to what we were talking about there a second ago. Tracks is really unskilled labor. It, it doesn't take a genius to do track work by any means. Um, and so that's something that as your club, you can have a work party. It's a great job to do while you're drinking beer. Um, uh, that's what we tell them. We're running, we're running. Just being honest. You know? Have a party. You know, it's a beer. You guys get your tracks done. Yeah, it, yeah it's, I mean, and it's not hard to do it. It's, it's just a matter of going through the labor. 
accent. What was that first thing? Point <laughs> point. <laughs> Just make sure you do the retort after. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Close is close enough. Next day. Um, any other questions on summer service? You guys are all kind of into that mode with your machines right yeah. now. Is there anything specific that you're wondering about? That service school you're talking about, is that a what's the length of that? Uh, ours is a two day school. Bring people in on like a Wednesday, or two, bring them out on Tuesday, it's a Wednesday, Thursday, and then they're out. We do a three day school. We come in Tuesday, and they're usually done by Thursday. And what we do for a lot of snowmobile clubs, buying new machines in particular, is rather than coming to school, because I know a lot of the snowmobile clubs, you know, you get a lot of volunteers, so you're working during, you don't take time off to come to school. So what we'll do is, We'll come to an individual school for each club and deliver the machine. I'll bring a mechanic with me and set it up. You know, we can go through and spend however many hours is necessary. Sometimes it's a couple hours, sometimes it's a day. We can yeah. It's a pretty standard practice. Yeah. Uh, going over some of the in season stuff, maybe stuff that you should have or might remind you to do next year. Uh, one huge one if you buy new machines, Probably the most important service of that machine's life is that first 100 hour break in service. Um, and if you're not totally comfortable with doing it, by all means, call your manufacturer and have them help you out with that. Um, that's those pieces, and as, as the pumps and everything break in, the gears wear, that change in that oil out of that first 100 hours. And it's 100 driving hours, so if your machine's been sitting and idling for some period of time, um, it doesn't need to be right at 100 hours on the clock. But that's a really, really important job they want to skip that. Every machine needs to do service, at least yearly. Um, our service interval on ours is, is 400 hours, which, so you're saying, you know, probably don't put on 400 hours every year. <laughs> so you can <coughs> Right. So, and I'm pretty you, sure it was real good for strong. It was probably up at 400. Yep. And that, here again, that's driving hours, you know, the, the idle hours are kind of put a little fudge factor. If you're doing 400 hours a year, you can probably get away with, well, you definitely get away with just one. If you're doing 500 hours a year, you can kind of track those, those operating hours. And you can probably still get away with just one. Uh, this is a big one just to, and it's difficult to do, we know, but if you can do a weekly or a 50 hour service where you just kind of bring it in, let it thaw out, it does wonders for the machine, getting the ice and stuff out of there. Going through and greasing everything, making sure everything looks okay. A lot of times you can catch those small problems before they become major problems. Some people all every, every leak starts out as a little bit of a wheat, and then it turns into a little drip, and then into a little spray, and then all of a sudden it dumps the tank. So if you can catch it when it's either a little wheat or a drip, you know, nine times out of ten you can save yourself the hassle of having a mess on the trail. And a lot of times, remember, if you've got a leak out, contamination can get in. These hydrostatic systems are very expensive and they're sensitive to contaminants. So you want to take care of any drips, leaks, quickly, whether they be catastrophes. Um, oils and filters here. And you can get this from either one of the manufacturers that are on here, but um, you, know, you want to make sure you're using the right oils for whatever you're working with. I was at a ski area not too long ago that the guy came down and said, it's low on skidder oil. <laughs> the mechanic said, well, what is skidder oil? What do you mean? Is it the engine oil? Is that that? He said, I don't know. I pulled out this jug and it said skidder oil on it. The guy said, okay, park the skidder. <laughs> We're done running that for now. So you definitely want to make sure you're using the right fluids, um, especially in the, the big gearboxes. Uh, we do use high-grade oil. It's it is expensive, but there's a reason for it. It's not just because we want to supply the oil companies with more money. Um, so you want to just make sure. And there, there's different oils that meet different specs depending on who your, your vendor is. So if you have questions, call whoever it is you work with and, and get, make sure you get the right oil. It's important. Uh, little things to watch for in the season. And uh, these are just a few that came to mind. You guys know what it is when, when you're getting that track pop? You know what's happening? Should I describe it? No. Okay, go 
basically it's when they strip it on the track. Yeah, it's it basically your your track is too loose, right. and so as it comes over the top of the sprocket, the sprocket's pulling it down the end on the top, and then when it's popping is when it actually is releasing out of it. That's the, the pop that you feel. And what that's doing when you think think about it, um, as it pulls that down, it's putting all kinds of stress on your track belt step, and it's you know it's flexing your grouser. So it, it, there's really a lot of forces that are going through before that thing actually pops off. You're going to have a little bit of track pop, you know, if you're going downhill and making a tight turn, you're going to have that, there's no way to get around. But if your tracks are popping every time you turn a corner, or, you know, every time you do anything, you, uh, <laughs> coming after me. Um, it, it, your tracks are just too loose, you need to tighten them up. A lot of the systems now have hydraulic track tension, you can adjust the pressure there. Yeah. It's something to be aware of. Um, tire guides and the tires. So there's a picture of a tire off the machine. That's actually a case where the, the air pressure was too low in that tire, so it was rubbing in the tire guides as it was going through. But you'll see, you kind of see here along the edge too. Yeah. If your tire guides are loose, they'll start to chew into the sides of your tires. So if you're doing as you're doing your pre-operation checks, you're seeing those tires are start to have some abuse in there. It's because there's a tire guide loose in there. And you said it, but you can always hear the, the tire guys loose as they're coming around. But a good way to see that that's happening is to check your tire. If you have the big damage like up here, if your tire pressure is just too low, you need to add air or, or in this case, get yourself a new tire. Um, another thing, we get calls all the time, I'm sure Tony does too, about lack of power in the machine. It really comes down to, in a diesel engine, there's air and fuel are really the two things that contribute to your power. So if you've got low power, <coughs> those things first. Um, got another picture here of a club, I won't say the club's name. Oh, that's a tire. That's a fuel filter. <laughs> or part of that. In the fuel system. These guys couldn't figure out why they had such low power in the machine. There's a clean one next to it. So if you go into your fuel system and you can see one that dirty, chances are that's part of your problem with your lack of power. Um, so certainly a first place to check. Uh, the other thing. got another club that called <coughs> couldn't figure out why their machine was low on power and this was the air filter we pulled out. They're not supposed to look like this. We get a lot of them that are iced up too. So if you're, if you're not getting air through, I know our machine, I think it does too, if, it, if there's a restriction in the air flow, it'll give you an indicator. But definitely if you open up the air box and it looks like this, it's time to buy a new air filter. during the summer test, I always try to talk to base on is your air intakes is to block them off to keep the critters from uh, making that their home for the summer. You can do a service, brand new air filter, go park the cap, come back in the fall and start it and think air filter restriction lights going on because the mice and the squirrels have made it their home. So you know, you know, check that. If you've done your service, block it off. We Tell customers you can put a screen in there, block of wood, something just to block it off, or in other cases, remove the air filter. So you have to put the air filter back in, set it in the front seat of the cap. And you got, in the fall, you've got to remember to put your air filter back in and you'll see if there's anything. Yeah, keeping mice out of your machine in the summer is a big item. They make a horrible mess. They love, I don't know what it is about those little wires, but they just love to go ahead. And uh, a little problem with the answer with yours. Yeah, yeah, my demo. Tell that story. Yeah, we had a demo machine. I forgot all about that. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>
And we were out running around, we were doing our demo all day long. And, and the first part of the day, it was sunny and nice out, so we didn't really think anything of it. But in the afternoon, it clouded over and started to get cold. And my cat had no heat. <laughs> it was really cold in there. It got to a point where people didn't even want to run it. So I was tinkering with it and playing and trying to find this or that. And finally, I had one of our techs come out. And uh, he pulled down the controller. It had climate control in it. He pulled the control box out and looked back in there, and it was a huge mouse. They were everywhere. So, needless to say, I don't know who the lucky customer is that's buying that down. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it happens quick. It can happen in season. If, you're, if your machine's parked for any period of time, it's, it's a, the dryer sheets seem to work pretty well. Just pack them in there. Any nook and cranny. Open up the center console. They, they like to find dark places. So somebody said peppermint flakes work really well too. Yeah. Um, but any, anything you can do to keep the out. Get peppermint spirits. You get the don't buy the true peppermint. Buy the, uh, the made up one. You use like Altoids? No, 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 no. Uh, peppermint. It's a it's a spirit. The oh, okay. Little, yeah. But don't buy the true one. You can get the I don't know. Whatever the other yeah. yeah, the artificial one, but it doesn't sit. And then you use cotton balls. We use them in the motor all the time. We knock on wood. We haven't had a mouse in the motor all the time. Okay. And in the spring, just put them up. Yeah, you know, well, that's, it smells good too. Right, that's the problem with mothballs. You don't have any mice in there, but your cat smells like mothballs. Yeah, the problem is not bad. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's a really good idea. It works. That's so far. Yeah, I learned something new. I can go back to my head. Um, this is just talking about the pre-operation check. Everybody's kind of got their own thing that works. <coughs> this is, I took this from a ski area, but it's just a little 5x6 six or 4x6 six sheet of paper that they do. That they go through every day before the machine leaves the yard. You can do the same thing. Just put it together, depending on how many operators you have, obviously this depends. But you go through, you check over the, your tracks, make sure everything looks okay. Check tension, check all your fluid levels, cap tight ends, tiller or drag, and plate locks, going over the drive looking for lights, anything like that. You know, it's it's great to have a little list of what's going on. You also have some accountability with your operator that way. You know, he signed off that, hey, this was okay. So if it was okay when he went out and he comes back and there's no more headlights on it, you can go to that guy and say, hey, you know what happened? So, um, and then you can also use a similar they have it here, yeah, after operation, um, which is a huge thing, to be able to look it over after you're done, when you get back off the trail, look through and see, you know, are, are the lights all still functioning, is there any leaks, is there any other problems, any bolts missing. Um, and then this is just sort of an operation thing. Def how many of you guys that run a machine have read the operator's manual? Better than a lot of us. Most guys don't even know where it is or the, the machine even came with them. But it's definitely, I mean, it's something, as the operator of any piece of equipment, it's your responsibility to know what's going on. Um, anything major with any of the manufacturers now has an audible alarm. If it's beeping and buzzing and screaming at you, don't just turn up the radio and keep going. Um, there's a reason for it. Yeah, they all have the indicator lights as well for some of the more minor things or other things. But, you know, any of those indicators that come on, you can go right into the operator's manual and see exactly what it's telling you. Uh, there is a ignoring idiot lights or alarms or the sophistication of the engines, the microprocessor systems, uh, the engine ECMs. You just can't ignore that stuff anymore. So my wife can. What's up? <laughs> my wife can. Yeah, <laughs> that's not a good excuse. <laughs> but my wife I'm does. Not, I'm not going there. <laughs> it, I mean, it, it adds up to big money in a hurry, especially anything with magnetic systems. You're talking tens of thousands of dollars in a heartbeat. In some cases. It doesn't take money. So. Yeah. Another thing, and I can't remember the club that set this up or told me, but they do. Anytime anybody wants to get in and be an operator of one of the machines for a year, they're required to work on it. They do the weekly maintenance on it. They do any services on it. 
they get a good understanding of the machine and they have a little bit better respect for it. Somebody that's never sat in a seat and never had to crawl under it or anything like that and just hops in and goes out on the trail and bounces off trees, they don't really understand what they're doing. So if you can help them get an appreciation of what's involved, um, it certainly goes a long way. So the employees are advantage. Any questions on service maintenance? Any of those items? We'll just go through real quick here on the efficient grooming stuff. Uh, we put together this presentation, or this part of the presentation. Uh, as the, the tier four emissions and things are coming up, machines are getting more expensive. Fuel obviously is getting more expensive, so it's just something to be aware of um, how much fuel you're burning as you're doing your job out there. This is just a quote from a, a magazine that deals more with trucking stuff. But the greatest single factor affecting fuel is your driver. The guy in the seat and his foot pretty much determine how much fuel is being burned. Um, we call it the green zone on our machines. I think that here too. There's a, a little <laughs> green area on the tack. <coughs> And it's the, the RPM range that's sort of the most efficient in these three terms. This is the different uh, curves on the PP400, but it, every machine's got a similar thing. Um, torque is on the top there. And you can see that this particular machine right around 1500 or just shy of 1500 is the, the sweet spot on it. Um, you want to be right at the top of the torque curve. That's, that's where you're getting your work done. You're pulling snow, you're pushing snow, you're doing, doing what you're out there to do. The horsepower really translates to speed. Yeah, you can add RPMs and you can pick up a little speed, but what really you look at here, this is the fuel consumption curve. If you get up there towards the top end of that horsepower range, your fuel consumption actually bumps up just a little bit. So you can, or you can sit back here in the little saddle where it kind of flattens off and you're getting the same amount of work and burning a little bit less. Uh, it's just something to be aware of as you're out there, as you're doing your job in your machine. There's certainly plenty of guys out there that just put their foot to the floor and go for it. Um, but it's, it's just, they're just basically they're just making noise and burning the fuel and not really gaining much. This goes through the different models that we have. On the PB100, it's about 1650. On the Edge, which is an older model, it's 1500. On the 400, it's 1450 note to operate in the green zone there. Idling time. You guys, have anybody kind of gotten to a point where they're tracking idling time with people? It is a little bit. We have GPS rovers. Yep. Um, yep. Every, uh, every rover is starting to look where you can see idling time. He must, right. be, he must be from Ontario. Yep, absolutely. And are they watching that idling time? Is somebody? I, I do. You watch it. Yep. Ah, there you go. It's, 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 but in our case, it's idling time. Like, you know, we can say, was he shut down for a half an hour lightning because he was moving the tree off the trail? We're trying to get a handle on what efficient use of the equipment. Yeah. Yeah. But just one thing we know from guys with tractor groomers, we were talking some of the max of speed 31 kilometers an hour. Wow. So we, that's where we found it. It's coming off to a road, running down a road, 31 kilometers. I don't know. I was going all up on the tracks on under your carriage and all that. <coughs> Yeah, I don't know if that's right. the tracks or how they hold up, but I can tell you, I don't know if it's like I know here. Uh, the drags are built, for the most part, to go between six and eight miles an hour. Yeah. Anything beyond that, you're just blowing snow out the side and not coming back from the trail. And, and that's the big thing. A guy was telling me last night about a, a situation where they were doing a demo, and a guy was screaming down the trail like that, got just off on the edge and caught a, a concrete barrier that was there and just folded the entire right front end underneath the machine. So that's, I think that's the biggest thing with speed like that, is that when damage happens, it's major damage. You don't, you don't ever bump into something. A lot happens to it. Yeah. Is there a question back there? Well, just the GPS units, that's when they're working, in his case. I We had as many here. as uh, <laughs> one third of them not working properly. Or hooked up his problem in Ontario. Because of the unit itself? Just the, or you could be the unit, the uh, hookup, draining the batteries, whatever you want to come up with. Yeah. In fact, they're still not all running properly yet. Yeah. 
Well, we know, because they're done it at ski areas, and I know of operators that will come to work with their little piece of aluminum foil and just put it over the ski unit so that nobody can pay it. can see what he's doing. You're saying limiting limit driving to just five minutes on any unit? That's, yeah, that's what the, the tier four stuff especially, but yeah, you can in hurt general. It. You can actually hurt, hurt the motor. Really? Yeah. Ours are old and they're still going, but we do more in five minutes. Oh, yeah. long. We're about 10. After warm up, be, that's yeah. Warm up is actually. That might be the next. There are people who do no warm up. Uh, yeah, I'll get to warm up in just a second. But yeah, the, yeah. idling. We're just talking about in the middle of your shift, going out and idling. The, the way that electronics and everything on these engines work, you don't have to sit there and let them just idle. Or you can go for five minutes and then you're all stuck. The other thing with idling, you're driving up the hours unnecessarily on your equipment. So if you have a high idle time, you might be adding extra services, you're depreciating your equipment faster, okay, and you're wasting fuel. So from a, an operation standpoint, it's just all cost of money. Uh, but you know, most of the manufacturers now, uh, we can track the microprocessor software or the engine ECM. We can hook up tell our customers exactly how much idle time is on the vehicle just by plugging in. It's getting a lot better. When we first started, we were seeing 26, 28% idle time. It's, it's insane. Yeah. You know, guys are leaving their cats idle for two, three hours a day. Well, the old way of doing it was you come in and you start up your machine and you go in and grab a cup of coffee and burn half an hour BS with your buddies or whatever. So there's a half an hour, and then you stop for lunch, and you're close to an hour, and then you got to let it cool down when you stop, so another half hour. So there's two hours on the eight-hour shift. There's your 25 percent. And from a sales standpoint, when we look at taking a vehicle on trade-in, the year of manufacture really doesn't matter. I mean, it, that's a very small piece of the puzzle. The hours on it are, are the, the determining factor. And so if you're running, if you're running 25 percent idle time. You know, over the course of the life of the machine, say it's six, eight thousand hours, you got thousands of hours of idle time. That, you know, you were, those are non-productive hours in that machine. So, yeah. It adds up real quick. It's, it turns into a lot of money, but it's expensive. Just a couple ideas for when to be aware of your idle time. You know, when you stop for a break, whether it's your lunch break or you take a break out on the trail, whatever it is. While you're fueling, how many people sit there in line and just let their machine sit and idle? Well, they're basically doing nothing. You know, it doesn't hurt anything to just shut it up and fire it back up. Warm up, couple questions on that. Uh, <coughs> with the new electronics and the, the new engines, when the temperature's above negative four, I don't know why they use that number, but they do. They say three minutes is all it needs to warm up. When it's below that, they say six months, six minutes is all it needs. And the old thinking was, quote unquote, warming up the machine meant you could get in there and immediately take off your jacket and get nice and comfortable and head out on the road. When they're talking warm up, they're just talking about the oil inside of that thing, getting everything circulated so it's moving freely. Um, and then the other piece of that is, as you pull away, you don't want to immediately drop your drag, load up the blade, and head out under a full steam. You got to let that oil move through a couple times and get, get warmed up. Um, it says here your full load can be applied when, you're, when it gets to 80 degrees Celsius on the temp gauge. Uh, and it does take a little bit of time. If you think about it on those machines here, the, the far ends of the machine, even when the engine's running and during that warm up time, your drag hydraulics, your blade hydraulics, all of those auxiliary functions, that oil is not circulating or moving at all. That's, that oil is just as cold as it is outside. So if you immediately get in there and just start jumping on the buttons and moving stuff around like crazy, you're pushing real cold oil through all of those orifices. It's usually when you blow a hose on the line, you know, pushing cold oil. Yeah. It, we get guys, you know, that'll just sit there and kind of run with no load on it, just walk in that couple minutes of warm-up time. You just move the blade back and forth, go through every one of the functions two or three times just to move that oil in and throughout the hose. On the other end, after um, a lot of, for a long time, they were saying you needed to 
let it idle for 10, 15 minutes in order to cool down. It's two minutes is all it really needs. And really, that's only for the turbo, is what you're doing to keep that oil circulating through the turbo as it winds down. Um, it's, it's the only thing that's really necessary to cool down. Uh, this is pretty standard across the board for everything out there. This technology with like the tier four engines, so that stuff gets more close to tolerances. We're using really ultra low sulfur fuel, so we're losing the lubricity. So having the knife and all that, or just pay attention to that. That's all I've got right now. Test piston like a pre hop kit. So that's I have about basically the same presentation. <laughs> Start over. <laughs> one more time. Are there any questions, specific things to your club that we didn't touch on? Yeah, I'm the VR 180s, which a lot of clubs will have different engine design. Is there a longer warm up on that? Nah, it's, it's the older 180s, the Perkins, and it's, it's still basically the same. Uh, six minutes and yeah, partial. Load. When that, everybody's idea of, of warming the engine up, I mean, that was all old school. The old early mechanical diesel engines, they needed that time to warm up. The newer engines, even the 180s, not so much. You know, three, four, five minutes, you're good. So most of everybody's, like Josh was saying earlier, the warm up time is for the operator. So he gets into a warm cab, which is what we see a lot of. Yep. A lot of our clubs don't have the luxury or the funds to buy a new machine, so sure. we're obviously looking at a used machine. Um, I heard you mention 8,000 hours, life of a machine. So maybe if, could you say a few words about picking out a used machine? What's the life or what's the rebuild, the uh, hour rebuild on the hydrostatic uh, motors and that? Or give us a little few pointers on uh, what to look for in a used machine? Yeah, sure. The, uh I mean, when we say the life of a machine, I was talking the life with a particular club. The machine, in a lot of cases, will go well beyond 10, 12, 15,000 hours. You know, we see it with lots out there. When you're looking for a new machine, or a new used machine, um, the big things to look at are your big dollar items. You know, get your, your pressures checked for your hydrostat, um, and then check over the tracks. Those are your two things that are, can immediately cost you money on a used machine. If the pressures check out and everything seems to be good with the hydrostatic system, you should be okay there. The tracks, you want to look at your belts and go through and, and see what kind of condition those are in and what they're going to need. Um, a lot of cases with, with used or refurbished machines, we'll bring them in and just put new track belts on. We'll replace the tracks all together if needed. Um, those are all your, Paul's our sales guy for the Midwest. And, that's progress. Rockets or windows, any glass, you know, those type of things. Um, but yeah, just focus on the high dollar items. Just like, uh, you know, what would you rather buy? A one owner 50,000 mile car or a rental car that had 20,000 miles on it for the same money? I mean, who had it, how they ran it is really a huge factor. Um, I'm actually out of the Midwest. Our customers don't are the, like the Eastern customers here. We get, you know, 400 hours a year is a lot of hours for a snowmobile club, maybe 500. But we also have some clubs in Michigan where they get three, 400 inches of snow that <coughs> run over 1,000 hours in, in a season. Um, likewise, all west, those guys can put that kind of hours on a machine. So uh, an 8,000 hour Western machine may be in as good a shape as a 4,000 hour Eastern machine, except that that 8,000 hour machine would probably be two or three years newer. You know? The other thing to ask well, for is, uh, sorry Paul. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure both manufacturers, we, we do evaluations on vehicles all the time. So if you see something that you're interested in, call your local branch. Ask them to come out and for a small <coughs> they'll come out or maybe even three. Come out and evaluate the capital. <coughs> Give you a report on the condition of it so you know exactly what you're buying. Yeah. Oh, what if a little old lady uses it to go to church? Church, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, a lot of times, if you get the serial number, you can just call our shop just by the serial number, which generally will have a lot of information. 
So a lot of it's how it's used, where it was used, and I think the big one is how it's stored. How it's stored. stored sure. yeah. yeah. If inside, you can find inside. a machine that you know the club or, or you're close by or you know somehow have some contact with them, then you can find out. You know, did, was it one of those clubs that had eight operators every year and it was a new crop of operators every time? That, that'll tell you something about that machine right there. Are you for Bruce? What do you need? I'm just curious. <laughs> they usually don't hear the rest of the story until after you own it. <laughs> yeah, well, that machine, yeah, we yeah, saw that, that to the bottom of a pond one. That was great. Yeah, wish I'd known the swim burner. Anything else? We tried to teach the swim. Yeah, yeah, if you want, we can walk up by the machines, take a look at them. If you have questions specifically on anything, yeah. I've got a question about half an hour before we need to be out there. Where's the pre off guy? Pre off versus uh, BR180. What's that? A new pre off versus a 180, a five year old 180. Uh, gas consumption difference. What, what is your estimation of the difference? Never mind what I hear. <laughs> on fuel consumption? Yeah. Well, I can I could, I could answer that. Right? Yeah. BR180. Well, I'm going to be around it. That's what she does.